Well, it's interesting, isn't it? The last year and a half. (laughs) But God is still working and moving. And he's still building his church. And uh, we just heard a report last week in the Philippines that uh, we've been recording radio um, or messages to go on the radio. And these have been going out to the far edges of the Islamic areas of the Philippines. And apparently there's several churches being formed. Even as we speak, so God is still building his church. It's not falling down. And the church, of course, is the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to talk to you today about Jesus. What greater subject is there in this universe but to talk about Jesus? Not just God, because there are many gods in this, in this um, world. Are, I go to India a lot, and there are millions of gods in India. You go to the Middle East, and you've got gods, you know, under Islam, and all sorts of things throughout the world. But Jesus has a name. And I want to talk to you today about Jesus. Because he is the one who is far, far, far above all. He is not just a God, but he is the God. He is the King of Kings. And I want to take you, first of all, to one of my favorite books, Revelation, Book of Revelation. And the Book of Revelation is a wonderful book, but it's been, it's been written for and revealed to just a small selection of people. Many people in this world will read Revelation and not make head nor tail of it, but Revelation has been written for a very small group of people. And here we read it, right at the beginning of Revelation chapter 1 and verse 1, and I'm reading from the New King James Version. And it says, The revelation of Jesus Christ. That's a wonderful thing. The revealing of Jesus Christ. Who is Jesus? Well, Revelation, when it's talked about in the Scriptures, is all about the heart and the mind of God for us. What's in the heart of God? What's God doing? It's all about what God's done in the past, what God's doing today and what God's going to do in the future, but it's his heart and his mind toward us. That's what revelation is. And it says here that this is the revelation of Christ Jesus. What we're going to look at here is Christ Jesus revealed to us, to you and to me. And here is the key. It says, which God gave him, that's God gave to Jesus to show his servants. Isn't that wonderful? God has given a revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed to his servants, to those who will serve him, to those who will lay down their lives for him, to those who will give up all else and go and serve him. There is something special to be revealed to God's servants. And here we read, well, I've just dropped all my notes, Whoa, which is one small bit of paper. I don't, I don't make a lot of notes, me. Oh, no, that was from last time. Here you go, look. It says, with things which must surely take place, shortly take place, and he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant, John. There we go. John was a servant, and therefore, God could reveal this to John. Isn't that wonderful? Are you a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you had special things revealed to you about Jesus? Have you? Because if you serve him, he will kind of take the wrappers off. This wonderful, wonderful person who is the son of God, who is the prince of peace, oh, who is the king of kings, who is the lover of our souls. And it's Jesus. Have you seen Jesus? Here we go. And he, and John was his servant, of course, who bore witness, this is John, to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, to all things he saw. John was a man who had been gripped since he first met Jesus. He had been gripped by this man, Jesus. He knew there was something special about him. He clung to him when he was his disciple. He even leant on his breast and he heard the heartbeat of God. What about that? He heard the breath of God. John was a man who loved Jesus with all his heart. He left his family. 
He left behind his career. He left behind his comforts. He wasn't afraid to speak out. He wasn't afraid to go out there and declare to the world about Jesus. He wasn't afraid to. He wasn't afraid to leave all the things of this world, to leave the safety of this world. He wasn't, he didn't mind if he was ill. He didn't mind if he was hungry. He didn't mind if he was thrown in prison. He didn't mind if he upset the authorities. He did not care about these things. He would go out and preach. And in fact, that's why he was in prison. But even being in prison, John was a man who was right in the center of God's will. What about that? And in that prison, in that place, on the Isle of Patmos, I've flown over it, actually, and I had to look down over it, and thought, God, I'd just love to go and walk around there, and you've probably been there, haven't you? No. But he was on the Isle of Patmos. He was in prison, and yet, he was in a place where God was going to open things up for him beyond his wildest imaginations. Wow. I'm going to take you right down to verse 9. Here we go. Here is the vision. I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ. What about that? He's our brother. He's our companion. He's our friend. Our friend who likes going to parties. Our friend who likes going to the golf course. Our friend who likes... No, 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 none of that. Not even the football. No, he says... I am your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ. What about that? Could you identify with that today? This is Jesus. This is the man he's going to reveal to us who has won John's heart. John has served him all his life and John's about to see a whole new side. Oh, what have we got here? I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice, as of a trumpet, saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And what you see, write in the book and send it to the seven churches. It's for all of us. It's for the churches all over the known world as they were then. All the main churches. And now it's for all of us. He's written it for us. Are we servants? This is for us if we are. Do we serve him with all our hearts? Oh, look at this, he says. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Look at that. What do you see? Write in a book and send it to the seven churches. Then I turned in verse 12 to see the voice that spoke with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. Isn't that wonderful? The seven golden lampstands represent the church. And if somebody hears God speaking to them, the first thing they will do is they will turn towards the church. Where is this God? They will, and we need to be ready for that. We need to be ready to tell people who've been spoken to by God what it's all about. We need to be ready to introduce them to Jesus Christ, the one who can set them free from the deepest need in their heart the deepest need of their soul. He can do it just like that. Hallelujah. Oh, the lady at the well, she she had a real revelation and didn't even know it. And when she said, oh, but the well is deep and you've got nothing to draw with. Do you know our lives, they are like that. They are so deep, deep, deep. How can we possibly address with our knowledge, with our studying, the depths of the human heart? We cannot, but God can. And Jesus can go right to the very beginnings of you and I and touch the areas that need touching, set free the areas that need setting free, minister to the areas that need ministering to, heal the areas that need healing. Oh, he can do it in an instant. He was our creator. What a revelation she had and she didn't even know it. And there you go. He's turning now towards the voice that spoke. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet. Can you imagine? Completely covered with this garment, right down to the feet, and girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and his hair were white like wool, 
as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if they burnt or as if refined in a furnace. And his voice is the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. It was like the sun at noonday, hardly a shadow there. The face of Jesus is like the noonday sun not hiding anything, no dark shadows, seeing all things right above. Oh, look at this. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. Wow. Do you know that's what happens when you and I come face to face with Jesus? We fall at his feet as though dead because compared to the very source of all life in the universe, we are dead. Wow. Have you ever had that experience? Or have you just believed on the basis of what someone else said? Have you ever seen Jesus? Because when you do, you will fall at his feet as though dead because it will bring everything into context. Everything in eternity into context. Lord, we are nothing in your presence. Nothing. Lord, we've served you, but we've done nothing. You don't need us, really, but you choose to include us, but we're nothing. And there is something about that in the Christian that realizes that God is everything and we are nothing. But then he fills us with his spirit, his spirit, and gives us a value once again. Hallelujah. I love that. He fell at his feet as though dead, and John would probably have qualified for more certificates and medals than, than probably most of us. Who knows? He was a man who would serve God through trials and tribulations, but when he saw the Jesus he loved, in his glorified state, he fell at his feet as though dead. Do you know, it's interesting, because if you look at the last time the world saw Jesus, it was hanging on a cross. Bone was separated from bone. Joints were dislocated. There was tears in his skin. There was blood running down his face from the crown of thorns. There was sweat from his brow. There was the unshaven look, I'm sure. There was blood coming from the nail prints on his hands from his feet where they were nailed into that cross. There was nakedness and shame on that cross. There was a side split open with a spear where blood and water and whatever fell out. He was a mess. There were marks all over his back where he'd been whipped and whipped. And then he died. And then he was brought down and buried. That is the last time that the world saw the Lord Jesus Christ. He only appeared after that to those who wanted to see him. If you look at who he appeared to between his resurrection and his ascension, it was just to his own people. It was just to those who were gone to call themselves Christians. It was just to those who knew him and who loved him and longed to see him again. The world didn't see him like that. That's why you see crucifixes around that the world's put up with all this mess because that's their last memory of the Lord Jesus Christ. But that is not where it ended because here we see him appearing to his servants completely different because he's there magnificent in power, wondrous in glory. (laughs) He's there as a victor. He's there as the one who is far above all. He's there as one who is on fire. It's a Pentecostal church, isn't it? Isn't it? Let's talk about the fire. Because Jesus is on fire. Right from his feet where you see there's like the brass that burning in a furnace. That's what the original talk, talks, um, tells you about it. Right up to 
his hands which had the stars in them, right up to the eyes where there's flames of fire, right up to the face where there is like the sun shining in its, you know, all over his countenance, like the noonday sun. He's on fire. Jesus is on fire. And his people are on fire. Hallelujah. You know, we're born into this world with all sorts of fires in us. Fires of lust, fires of hatred, fires of jealousy, fires of ambition, fires... Oh, dear. You hear it, don't you? Anger, lust, all these things I could go through the list and you can fill them all in later. But all sorts of false fires and wrong fires burn in the human heart. But you know, when we come to Jesus and when we see him like this, all other fires go. You will lose your temper forever. What about that? It won't keep coming back again because you'll be full of the fire of God. Hallelujah. When he comes and baptizes you in this glorious spirit of his, you will have within you a fire, which is not your fire, which is not a human fire, but it's a fire of Jesus Christ. It's that same fire that burns. And there will be something within you which will be able to look at the world and they will be able to see there's something about you which brings them to Jesus. It's a wonderful thing, the fire of God. And it's to burn. It's to burn in his people. It's to burn in his servants. It's not about ambition. It's not about making money. It's not about pensions. It's not about careers. It's not about any of these things, but it's about the fire that will go out into the world and preach the gospel. It's about the fire that will go out and love the unlovely. It's the fire that will go into prisons. It's the fire that will go into hospitals. It's the fire that will go to the far ends of the earth to people who have threatened to kill you and say, I love you. I love you, not with my love, but with the fire that God's put within me. Oh, hallelujah. This is a fire. This isn't a nationalistic fire. This isn't about which type of church you belong to. This isn't about anything like that. This isn't about which football team you support. This isn't about what political persuasion you are or whether you're for education or whether you're for water pumps in villages or whatever it happens. It's not about that. It's a fire which will love with the love of God. Oh, and John saw it and he fell at his feet as dead. And Jesus just said, do not fear. Poor, my time's racing away here. Let's just turn to Luke 3. Luke in chapter 3. Because John the Baptist, this is another John who also loved Jesus, and he was a man who came with the goal, or the goal, the, the calling for baptism of repentance. And he says, whoops, excuse me, I indeed baptize you with water. This is John the Baptist saying that. But there is one mightier than I. This is in verse 15. Sorry, I didn't say that, did I? Oh, maybe I did. But there is one mightier than I is coming whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. What about that? God has promised to baptize us in the Holy Spirit and with fire. The two go together. You can't have the Holy Spirit and then go home unchanged. You can't be baptized in this glorious Spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ and be unchanged. It will transform your life. It will transform your future. It will transform your eternity. It will transform those around you. It will transform your calling. If you go out there with fire. Wow, he says, his winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather the wheat into his barn and the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. The rubbish in our lives will be burnt 
with an unquenchable fire, the fire that is God himself. Hallelujah. That's a bit strong, sorry. I'm not apologizing. For I've met this, these people. Fire, fire. Hallelujah. It's just like Jesus in the temple, wasn't it? I was reading that the other day and I thought, my goodness, what would that have been like? He stood up in the temple amongst all these traders, people trying to make money in the, in the, in the people like that in the church, aren't they? Trying to make money out of the church, writing a book and selling it to you all, for a big profit, running around in big jets and all sorts of things. They're trying to make money. But he took this cord, he made a scourge of cords, and he worked them all out. He didn't care that their money was going all over the place. He didn't care who was hurt. He didn't care what was damaged. He was going to have them all out of the house of God. And God deals with us like that. When he comes in, he will burn with unquenchable fire the rubbish in our lives. He will. He'll deal with it. Maybe it's not all on the first day. Maybe it'll take a few years. Maybe. It took me a long time. <laughs> but you know what? Once God's got all of our hearts, it's easy to let him do that. So easy. Let's just move to Acts 2. A couple more verses and then we're done. Acts 2, Acts chapter 2. And verse 1. Hey, this is Pentecostal church stuff. And when the day of Pentecost had fully come, They've been praying for something. They, I often wonder, what did they pray in that upper room? The only prayer, really, that Jesus gave them to pray was the Lord's Prayer. And I believe that at Pentecost, everything in that Lord's Prayer was answered. People came into a place where they could worship God and worship the Father and call him Father. People came into a place where they knew that their sin was given, forgiven and dealt with. Where they could not just know that, but where they could forgive themselves. <sighs> People knew that within their hearts and within their lives, suddenly the will of God was being done on earth as it is in heaven. Hallelujah. And I'll let you fill in all the gaps, but it's a great study. All of those things the Christian knows as the norm because of the day of Pentecost. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven and as a rushing mighty wind and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them like divided tongues. So it was the opposite of lightning. It came down singly and then was divided. Lightning's the other way around. And of fire, as of fire. And one sat upon each of them. What about that? Are you ready for that to happen this morning? Why shouldn't it happen? God wants to move in his people. God wants to do something that's deep and lasting. God wants to set us alight as a people so that this world can hear about the precious Lord Jesus Christ who has come to save them and set them free. Hallelujah. Hallelujah where we can get on our knees and weep for the Romanians, for the Serbians, for the Indians, for the British, for the Scottish, oh, for the Welsh even. Hallelujah. <laughs> no Welsh here, are there? I've just come back from Wales. Oh my, oh my. Apparently they believe in Wales that Welsh is going to be spoken in heaven. I think really... I need to read the scriptures. <laughs> oh, but the language of heaven is one of love. The language of heaven is one of embracing your neighbor. The language of heaven is one of laying down your life for your brother, for your sister, for your neighbor, for your enemy even. And weeping. Why not? Why not? Oh, look at this. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. It wasn't about tongues. They were to be baptized with fire. You will speak the language of heaven when you're baptized with fire. 
You will speak about Jesus with a deep affection. You will speak about Jesus as your Savior, as your Lord. Oh, he's wonderful. He's absolutely wonderful. There's no greater place to be than lying at his feet. (coughs) He's absolutely wonderful. That's what happened at Pentecost. That's what can happen today. I'm just going to tell you to one last scripture. And then I'll leave you to contemplate. Luke and chapter 9. Some people think that God is going to punish people that we don't like, doesn't he? You ever thought that? Oh, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Lord, can you get your own back for what that person did to me? You know, we do, well, we do. We think about these things sometimes. The ve- vengeance, by the way, is not the same as revenge. You need to make a study on it. It's very, very different. Vengeance is not the same as revenge. And God will never revenge somebody for offending us. But in Luke chapter 9, these people, they hadn't quite got it. These are disciples. It's good, I'm not quite used to this. And it says here, in verse 54 of chapter 9, the disciples and Jesus had gone through a Samaritan village. The Jews didn't like the Samaritans. And what happens now, it came to pass, in verse 51, when the time had come, for him to be received up, that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem and sent messages before his face. And as they went, they entered a village of the Samaritans to prepare for him, but they did not receive him because his face was set for the journey to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, the same John we've just been reading about, who fell at his feet as dead, The same John saw this. They said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? What about that then? Well, they they ignored you. Let's call the fire down and consume them. But what did Jesus say? He says, but he turned and rebuked them and said, you do not know what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. Wow. Isn't that wonderful? He's not out to get revenge. He's not out to be the big judge. Well, the judgment will have to come because the rubbish has to be removed from our lives. And we have to be willing to let it go. But Jesus has come to save you. He's come to save me. He's come to love you. He's come to love me. He's come to love the whole world and to give them the opportunity to turn away from their sin and to come to him and be set utterly, utterly free. Free to do what? Free to realize your ambition? No. Free to become a glorious preacher or something of an apostle? No. John could have easily have described himself as an apostle. He didn't. He described himself as a servant. Jesus sets us free so that we can serve him. And serving him isn't a laborious, terrible thing. Serving him is a great joy. Just to serve him and to serve him and to serve him just like we will in the kingdom to come. But we've got to be baptized into this fire. We've got to be brought right into God. I'm always a bit on edge when I hear people saying, well, Jesus is walking beside me and he's walking in front of me and all this sort of thing. But you know, he's come to baptize into himself. We are to be those people who live in Christ. I love a good fire pit or a bonfire on bonfire nights or something like that. And we've got a new fire pit. David just bought me one for my birthday. And you sit around the fire pit and you put logs in it and you're all nice and warm and toasty and it's great. But have you ever noticed how when you're sitting around a fire pit or standing around a bonfire, your back's always cold and your front's always hot? Isn't it annoying? But that's the way it is. And that's like that for the people who are following Jesus. We've got to be in Christ. 
That's what the baptism of the Spirit does. It brings us into Christ. He baptizes us all around. So we're in Christ, and Christ is in us. And he never leaves us. He never forsakes us. He's there. He's ever present with us. And we, we know him within us. And we can walk down the street and say, Lord, thank you. I'm walking through the world somehow. I'm walking through all this mess, all this bad news that we're saying all the time. I'm walking through this, this coronavirus, whatever it is. Oh, lots of theories about it. But to be in Christ, you're wrapped around in him. You're protected by him. You're loved by him. Yes, you might catch coronavirus, but your soul won't. Your soul will not be because God, because you're a, you're a servant. He loves you. You're part of his church. Wow. Isn't that wonderful? Jesus is wonderful. Jesus is wonderful. If you haven't got this, if you've never seen Jesus like that, seek him and I promise you, I promise you, the Lord Jesus Christ, you will find him. Absolutely promise you. It took me about four or five years of responding in meetings. I said, Lord, I've got to have it because I can see other people have got it. I've got to have it. I don't care what people think about me. I don't care what reputation I've got. I've got to have it, and I would be out here responding to meetings where they hadn't even asked for a response, and they hadn't even stopped preaching sometimes. I said, I've got to have it. And I remember God did it for me when I was 19 years old. And I've never backslidden since. I've never needed to backslide since. Okay, I've made errors, I've done wrong things and things like that, but I have never backslid. I've always known deep within me that Christ has done something there, that he's put a fountain there that he's put his fire there. Hallelujah. Oh, he didn't come to do a half job. He hasn't come to patch us up. He hasn't. He's come to redeem us so that we can be a redeemed people. We're far more than a friend. We become sons. Sons. Brother of John. What about that? We're son of God. Hallelujah. Praise God. May the Lord bless you all. Thank you.